you and him can wear it to have the contact me, yeah? Seattle. So, nothing you need. Hello and welcome to Data Hangout, hosted by Strata Conference and O'Reilly Media. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Annalise Clint, and I am the Community Manager for the Data Practice Area at O'Reilly Media. I am also joined by Conference Chairs Alistair Prawl, Roger Magulis, and Program Development Director Ben Lorica. We will be discussing what's ahead for, for data in 2015 and how to submit a killer speaker proposal for Strata San Jose coming up this February. I'll also be asking questions on behalf of the Strata community. If you haven't yet, please submit your questions on Twitter to hashtag data hangout or in the comment section of this YouTube stream. You can also join hashtag data hangout on Twitter and Google Plus to participate in a live conversation about this event. Without further ado, Alistair, what did you want to discuss today? Well, thanks, Annalise. Um, I think the, the field of big data is moving really fast. And so we kind of wanted to take a breath, uh, even though we're on the cusp of the New York event, and uh, look at what trends we think are going to be big next year. We did this last year, and it led to some really, really good proposals. Uh, we, we threw up a bunch of things that we were thinking about, and uh, we were really gratified to see the number of people that, that uh, went, went a little deeper and found some good topics. Um, and we have such a huge volume of proposals, we were, we're thrilled to see all these ideas. Uh, so we wanted to spend some time talking about the trends we saw, and also, um, obviously, we have far more uh, proposals to talk than we can handle at the conference, uh, so we wanted to tell people what they might do to run a better chance of being, being chosen or included by the program committee. So... Um, uh, ben and Roger and I, along with uh, the rest of the crew at O'Reilly, um, have been spending a lot of time talking about where things are going and uh, looking at certain verticals that are emerging that are taking advantage of data. And uh, really the, the goal of today's call is to kind of level the playing field and set the stage for what we think is going to be big next year and what kind of things we're looking for. So um, i got Ben and Roger on the other side there. Uh, you guys have been hard at work on this stuff. We're, we're still the call for papers for... Um, uh, next spring is open, um, and uh, Ben, Roger, what are you guys hoping to see in that in that set of submissions? Well, the the topic is getting so broad these days that there's a number of things that we'll be uh, that we'll be looking for. I can highlight a couple of things that we see that kind of trending up. One is uh, real time. We're seeing more people doing real time. Not that real time is the is necessary for every piece of data, but doing real-time in a particular sort of way. And we think that the whole field can learn from the way these, these early adopters are working on it. Plus, the tools have really uh, matured uh, across the board, making these real-time things work. Uh, we're also seeing people talking about the ELK stack, along with uh, Spark and uh, some of the other tools. We, uh, as always, we love case studies that show interesting um, applications of not just the technology, the techniques, but, but really how it's integrated into the business. You know, how do you go from I want big data to I'm making better decisions, to I'm asking the right questions, to how to organize uh, your data folks. Uh, we also bring up, I mean, internally we have these architecture pictures around the topics of data engineering, and data science, and we know that data engineering, particularly around preparing data for analytics, is very important. There's new tools in this space, there's new ways to look at that, just doing taxonomies, things like that. We'd love to see um, ways that the community can learn on how to uh, make that less of an onerous part of the, um, the task. Uh, we also, just in the privacy um, security world, I think three years ago at Strata, that wasn't a big issue, and now it's something everyone's got to pay attention to. Uh, so we like to see how security can be brought in without making the um, analytics go away. And clearly with all these privacy breaches, um, it's something that's in, that's in the news and anything that can stop that. So. Uh on uh, my end, I mean, so Roger covered kind of the high-level things that we're tracking, but so there's specific topics that we'd love to see proposals on. Uh, 
So for example, when people think about security and data, um, uh, that in itself is a broad topic, but uh, one particular aspect of it that uh, I'm particularly interested in is uh, uh, secure machine learning, right? So how do you devise uh, models and algorithms that are resistant to uh, clever attacks? Um, and then there's a related, uh, related topic of adversarial analytics, so, so people who devise algorithms to attack uh, recommendation systems, for example. So that's on the data science side. On the data engineering side, actually, even as Roger mentioned, right, so we, it's a topic that we track closely, but uh, a particular aspect of it is data integration. Uh, so people talk a lot about, a lot about data wrangling. Uh, that's something probably data scientists do a lot more of. But just the notion of uh, designing robust data flows from one system to another that uh, can handle multiple different uh, workloads and uh, uh, latencies, um, that's something that uh, we think is still an area where uh, there's a lot of people who can uh, share uh, best practices. And generally, I think in the data engineering side, we're very keen on architecture kind of uh, proposals, uh, people who can share uh, best practices. And uh, uh, I think we all know that uh, the big data ecosystem, there's a lot of components that are already in the early phases of maturation. So there's opportunities for people to uh, combine many of these different uh, software components together. But there's still that whole question around architecture. So how do you, what are the best practices for doing that? Yeah, we, we notice that people are interested in that topic anyway in architectures. And the kind of like great way to uh, show that off is to show what you learn in your architecture and, and why things are there. You know, we, we sense that there's a coalescing around particular architectural styles, um, whether it's the integration piece or how you have formal access to data versus the kind of sandbox exploratory access to data. And if you make that formal, you, you kind of encourage both aspects of analytics, which is important. Uh, another topic that we really like, and it relates to how machine learning integrates into any organization, that's cognitive augmentation, is where do you draw the line between what the machines can do and how they interact with people, and how important the user interface is to making that work. Uh, you know, machine learning on its own, without any uh, editorial, we can call it, uh, look at the results, is likely going to lead to uh, some problems. But how do you know what humans should look at, and how do you draw those lines? We think that is, that's going to be very interesting, and is the kind of thing people are increasingly going to be looking at in the future. So what about you, Alistair, on, the, on kind of the data-driven business day side of things? What are you looking for? Well, I think Roger summarized it there that, that, you know, in the early stages of any industry, it's always about how do we do these things. Um, I joked a while back that um, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you have a Hadoop cluster, everything looks like big data. Uh, but I think that now we're starting to get beyond the how and into the why. Um, why am I doing this? What are the business consequences? And also, what are the, the sort of societal consequences? So I'm fascinated with the fact that, you know, Home Depot just had apparently what may be the biggest breach ever, and we're all kind of like, oh, data breach, all right, what else? Um, yeah, it's making me wish I didn't buy those LED lights. That's right. Um, so I think that it's, it's you're becoming very, we as a society, we're becoming very blasé about this data, and I think uh, you touched on a little, Ben, the idea that uh, adversarial attackers can use that to compromise algorithms. You know, as we increasingly move to a world where we're using algorithmic regulation and algorithmic legislation, do we have the societal will to think these things through? Um, one example that, that I was thinking about the other day, so the uh, U.S. highway system is about to collapse because there's been an 18-cent tax on, the, uh, on gas to build highways, but inflation has continued apace, and now that model of taxation doesn't work. If you drive an electric car, you get a free ride because there's no taxation on what you do. The right way to regulate that would be to say we're going to tax you a certain amount per mile driven times the mass of your car. That would be like everybody looks at it and goes, yeah, that's the math, right? 
but do we have the organizational and legislative will? We have the technology to do that. I mean, that's easy. You go in for your smog test, you check how much you've driven, you get taxed that amount, or some kind of RFID tag or whatever. The problem is not the technology. The problem is the organizational will, that we are stuck with a system that is antiquated and inaccurate, but there are so many sort of legislative and uh, consumer hurdles. You know, imagine the field day the Tea Party would have with they want to track our cars everywhere we drive and tax us for everything when in fact that's how you pay for the roads, right? So we have this amazing power and we're shirking all the responsibility. And that really, I think that's a fascinating issue because the companies that get ahead of that curve and sort of, or the governments indeed, that get the organizational will to actually do that stuff are are going to win. And it's it's just amazing to me how hard it is. I mean, I spend a lot of time talking to big companies and some of them get this and they're running at it as fast as they can. And others are just burying their heads in the sand and hoping that, that, that something breaks so they're not in trouble. And, and so that's one of the things I'm really fascinated with. Uh, Roger, I'd like to go back to something you said earlier on. Way back when, three years ago, we had Avinash Kaujik uh, talking at Strata in Santa Clara. And he said, real time is stupid because humans can't make decisions in real time. Um, I'm paraphrasing, but his idea was that people who say they want real-time analytics but are unable to act on those those uh, that knowledge in real time um, are wasting a lot of organizational effort getting to real time. And his conclusion was that you want the right time, which is like line up the data you get with the speed at which your organization can respond. Uh, obviously, when you have a cybernetic, like a feedback loop, where you have data uh, being collected and then the machine is responding, we all understand why you need speed. That's just uh, sort of algorithmic trading. But it seems to me that now that we're um, going to humans and letting them explore data, real time suddenly makes more sense. Because now, you, you know, you're, you're trying to get the human into that flow state where the system they're analyzing and exploring, and some of these more advanced sort of visualization and, and exploratory analytics tools, it seems like there's a role for real time, not so much in the tell me what's going on, but in the allow me to explore my data so it feels like it's real. Uh, how do you think the, 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 the new kinds of interfaces for data exploration are putting pressure on some of the real time data stacks to keep up? Yeah, you know what, I want to reiterate, and I forget the person's name, but I, I totally agree with them. Real time, when it's not appropriate, is a big waste of money and, and energy. Uh, but what we are seeing is, like you described, high frequency trading. Things that are related to that as a place where it's applicable. So, I mean, the kind of classic case is around like web activity where you're trying something out, <coughs> excuse me, and you really do want to monitor it and see what's going on in a relatively um, real time. And the, you know, you also brought up exploration. And exploration of um, uh, some kind of system, usually you want like a certain density of data, and with real time you can get to that density uh, better in, in when, when the short temporal times make sense. So you'd use the term um, right time instead of real time, and you know real time is kind of a loaded expression. And I think quite often right time is what makes sense. Um, it doesn't mean that you need an instant and that there's a bunch of people waiting around. I've got a decision to make and I need the, the most up-to-date stuff. But there are cases where, where that's true and they're probably asynchronous, but if you don't have it instrumented to get to that real time, you're not going to be able to, to, to even make those decisions. And I mean, a lot of the things uh, now are coming out of commerce, but it's a lot of Internet of Things and as you look forward, that's going to be a place where this kind of um, real time is going to matter. I mean, the, the self-driving car, should it ever uh, happen, is going to depend on a lot of uh, real time machine learning and real time data uh, to make that work. Um, and you can take that out to, to many other things. And just as I have needed a new garage door uh, opener, and my garage door opener is connected uh, to the internet, and I can check whether it's open or closed. Uh, here from this uh, remote office. Uh, That's a big but, enough value add for you to look that, that you might, that other people might be able to hack your garage door. Uh, absolutely. I live in Oakland. You know, <laughs> security is. <laughs> I, I'm joking, um, but it wasn't. I actually wanted it uh, uh, to do because I've got uh, 
two kids and people are in and out of the garage all the time. I want to every now and then check to make sure it's closed. So it's interesting, you know. Let's come back. You said you said we're moving on to this world where people are deciding better, and I love that decide better meme. Uh, you guys have spent a lot of time talking with Tim about cognitive augmentation. What I really want is a garage door opener that says to me, hey, Bozo, your garage door's been open for a while and nothing's gone through it. Like, I don't want to know the garage door's open. I want the garage door to know that I should care about it being open. Hey, it's well, 3 p.m. and your garage door's open and you're all asleep. Right. That's, that's where the computer gets better, and it's not AI. It's this idea of cognitive augmentation where, uh, and, and I've referred to this in the past as, designing for interruption, that the, the right information, it seems to me like a lot of this is moving towards not just deciding better, but knowing when to interrupt with the right information. Um, and, you know, Google Now and Siri and Cortana and other products like that are doing a really good job of saying, hey, Alistair, you should leave for your meeting because the one-on-one's kind of busy and, you know, you usually drive this way and I know you've got a little bit of time. you got a, you got a 130 appointment down on LinkedIn, whatever. And that classic sort of example is, is to me just the, you know, there's the take your meds examples, lots of low hanging fruit there. But the, this idea of cognitive augmentation where your garage door opener learns about you and decides what you want uh, is to me where the real power is. So can you guys expand on that idea of, of how computers are going to help us decide better short of the HAL 9000? Yeah, let me, I want to make one quick point, um, which is we are very early in this. The fact that my door has this feature, they think it's great. <laughs> Getting to where you are, which doesn't require very much coding, uh, is like, you know, they're going to get there. The Nest, right, uh, help help lend the way to that. So I I agree the whole interrupt thing. I, you know, I'll bring it to the quantified self movement, where the early adopters tend to be people with severe OCD, uh, and want to look at their results, want to see everything, won't go for a run if it's not tracked. But what most people want is you're trending down, you're not you know, moving as much, your, your weight's up over this time, maybe it's time to check something out. They don't really want to check in every day, they want someone to be monitoring things and noticing these uh, anomalies or these trends that they might want to attend to. So the notion of uh, a nice Clippy. <laughs> you remember Clippy from uh, Office, uh, and um, you know, helping you as an advisor who's paying attention to what's around you. Kind of so your idea of an ideal computer companion is a diplomatic friend with OCD. That's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think my particular towards this. My particular uh, interest in cognitive augmentation is probably a lot more tied to uh, uh, data business analysis, right? So the democratization of data science. So we're seeing a lot of tools that really allow a regular business analyst to perform more data science skills. So I think those tools now are in the one or two year cycle. Uh, so I think in this go around the strata, okay, so now we have these tools, as Alistair points out, what are companies, uh, what are the interesting thing companies doing with some of these tools to take a business analyst and give them uh, the power to do advanced analysis, right? So that's one. So the other thing that you guys talked about is the Internet of Things. Certainly it, that's something that, that we at Strata pay attention to. But uh, myself in particular, I'm fascinated by the fact that the back-end systems for uh, making sense of data that comes from the Internet of Things is probably going to look very similar to some of these big data platforms that we're seeing now, right? So it'll have uh, an offline storage component, it'll have uh, an asynchronous system, a stream processing system tied to it, and uh, an online storage system in memory, right? Uh, but fundamentally, I mean, the basic unit of analysis is something that people in the IT operations world have looked at for many years. It's event data. So we, you know, I'm personally very interested to see what people, what are the interesting things doing, uh, people are doing around event data, particularly at scale. So as you're, as you're having to analyze hundreds of millions of uh, time series, for example, what are the interesting things 
uh, people are doing out there. That would be an interesting. It, it, it's funny you mentioned the network management. So my, my background years and years ago was in the network management space, and I look at the architectures we're seeing for the Internet of Things, and I think about like the Tivoli and HP OpenView and uh, CA Unicenter, all these tools that were you know just gathering millions of events and coordinating them and coagulating them and sort of consolidating them and sending them on uh, to things that would run thresholds. The architectures are very similar. Um, we're hearing this new term, fog, and at first I was like, oh, boy, the cloud industry needs another term, right? Especially because it's promoted by the Cisco's and Qualcomm's of the world. But the fundamental idea is you've got sort of a personal area network of your Internet of Things and then something doing local consolidation. So if I've got a thing that's measuring the temperature in my house every second, um, what I actually want is the five-minute moving average and a count of exceptions above or below a threshold. And so the dumb Internet of Things collector device is just sending back a feed of, of temperature every second, which is way too much. And then there's something else doing some kind of clever aggregation. Um, once that thing exists to do aggregation, it seems like we need systems management tools to say, hey, it's time to upgrade that device with a new patch, right? So the architecture doesn't just look like billions of things and a center you have these uh, regional networks and you wind up with what looks for all the world like old network management or old um, almost BGP routing models, right? Where you have stuff happening locally and then it's a whole new network architecture um, for event management. And I think uh, as we start to scale up the Internet of Things, we're going to say, look, you've got this thing in your household that does disaster recovery and it backs up data when you're temporarily disconnected. It does aggregation and thresholding and alerting, and then it federates that information off to uh, certain third-party sort of centralized data analysis tools. That's a fascinating architecture because it's not really big data and it's not really networking and it's not really event management, but it's it's certainly a fairly new and novel model, and I think that's going to just fuel uh, industry growth for a few years at least. Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd like to take a piece of that and, and go and... Um direction around data centers as being a great archetype for the Internet of Things. You're controlling a ton of devices and the um, kind of stack of rules and machine learning and everything that makes that work uh, is likely going to be the prototype for what's next. And I think, um, you know, we'd love to see how people are, are, are doing that kind of work in a way that then others can learn how to handle large arrays of, of devices and manage them in a way that we talked about cognitive augmentation, that humans can, can make sense of something that really no human could possibly monitor uh, on their own without the help of, of machines. And, and those architectures and those techniques, I think, will be, um, will be really interesting. Um, you know, I also yeah. wanted to... It does seem like, you know, that's where we get into what Ben was talking about, adversarial attacks. If I wanted to sneak into your house and you had some kind of a thermal sensor um, and I knew that the threshold was like a five-minute moving average, I could very gradually increase the heat until I could walk into your house, right? So all of a sudden, I mean, it's a silly example. It sounds more like a spy movie, but uh, algorithmic regulation. A uh, great example is, you know, what's the speed limit in California? 65. No, that's a speed suggestion. I mean, it is. Otherwise, they'd ticket everyone who went 66, right? Um, and so when you have a speed limit of 65, what speed does the uh, speed suggestion of 65, what speed does the self-driving car go? Does the owner need a knob that says, uh, I will gradually increase this, right? Um, Google's a big investor in, in uh, Uber. If they want to raise revenues, all they need to do is change the maps of the required routes, right? So there's all these issues about um, wh whoever owns the algorithm can change the law in subtle ways that don't necessarily trigger the algorithms that watch the algorithms. Um, and so the, I love the idea, you know, people, people say, who watches the watchers? Well, what algorithms measure the algorithms? And I think we're going to see the equivalent of um, uh, algorithmic trading applied to things like legislation. And uh, those are fascinating uh, trends because at some point we know that the black box evolved algorithms are more efficient, and yet they're the ones that are hard, it's hardest to tease apart and understand. Uh, is society ready for that stuff? I mean, that's just... That's crazy to think about. Yeah, so if you have uh, presentations around those topics, send them in. It is yes, really please. a fascinating yeah. <laughs> uh, topic. You know, I have to bring up a few years ago, uh, the DOD had this red balloon challenge, 
and it was to track a bunch of red balloons. And I don't have, I'm going to throw out a percentage, I don't know that this is right, but it was somewhere in this range, that 70% of the traffic was trying to fake out the other teams. Uh, I think there might be some law about human nature, particularly in groups, around that. So I think we can expect that anything that happens in the world is going to have a certain percentage of adversarial obfuscation work, and we all need to be able to handle that, no matter what it is. You know, I mean, there's just recently, because we're in the Bay Area, Yelp was sued because of their extortion racket, <laughs> with their, um, whether advertising helps improve your score, and the judge basically said, I won't swear, tough canoogies. <laughs> uh, you know, Yelp is a business and they can do what they want. Yeah, so, I, I had a chat with a Yelp driver in D.C. And Yelp, one, uh, not with Yelp, sorry, with an Uber driver in D.C. And the guy said, look, um, we one of the promises of, Yelp, of Uber was that um, it would tell us where to park to maximize our load time. That's now a place where all the limos park. So I'm now ignoring that algorithm. And uh, I now have my own secrets for where I go because in this, this hotel, the guys tend to tip or whatever, right? And... What's fascinating, I, I heard this, and I am going to swear because I have no such proclivities, um, but I heard someone refer to this as algorithms that shit where they eat, um, meaning an algorithm that, that once it becomes available um, and people understand it, it, is, it loses its effectiveness very quickly. And I think this is one of the things we haven't talked about is that um, when people get really good at racing to the local maxima, the value of the global maxima, which is a leap of faith because it's not informed by optimization, becomes much more valuable. And uh, that's certainly something we want to cover in the data-driven business day. I really want to hear examples of uh, where optimization became the status quo and therefore didn't confer any advantage to the industry. And so people had to do something counterintuitive to find a new set of rules because I think we're going to see more and more of those. Uh, to your comment on the DARPA challenge, it was the Nerd Fighters team. They had 2,000 balloon seekers and they had 3,000 Nerd Fighters who simply scanned social networks to misdirect and misinform other teams. Brilliant. So, yeah. Uh, so there's a, there's a couple of specific uh, uh, proposal ideas I'm going to throw out there. One is uh, uh, we know that Spark is ascendant. So we see that in Strata New York. We see that um, with the number of companies submitting proposals on Spark. And uh, so I, I want to announce that we're actually going to bring back Spark Camp to Strata, California. So that will be an all-day training day on the first day that on the tutorial day. Um, so we're interested in seeing how companies actually use Spark. Uh, we're seeing those proposals in New York, but now maybe we can even start talking about how do people architect Spark a applications, right? So uh, I think we're, uh, it might be time to start that, that discussion now that more and more companies are using Spark. Maybe there's best practices for uh, uh, putting Spark in your stack, uh, sure. number one. Number two, um, you know, people are fascinated about deep learning, so are we, but we take kind of a bigger uh, perspective around it, so we think about the, that machine learning pipeline and what deep learning really excels at is really doing optimization across that pipeline so that uh, basically you automate most of those steps, right? So including the feature engineering and all of those things. But the drawback being it's a black box, it's not explainable, it's not interpretable, uh, it's not particularly fast, it uses, it requires GPUs at least uh, mostly. So we're interested in seeing what people are doing for, uh, to mimic what deep learning is doing. So taking yeah, that... Tell me, tell me, I mean, you keep saying deep learning, it's like you're skirting around the term AI, is it time to bring that back up or are you can... No, I think, I think uh, deep learning might be part of AI. So, I mean, certainly it's, uh, it's usefully associated, and uh, we will have a session on that. I mean, uh, we have, a, we have a, a friend who writes for O'Reilly Radar, Bo Cronin, who, who probably will do an overview on the state of art of AI. But particularly, we're interested in what people are doing for this machine learning pipeline, right? So how do you automate all those steps, uh, including the feature engineering, but also how do you deploy, I mean, to Alice, what Alistair was earlier alluding to, how do you deploy some of these models in production, keep them up, 
and almost adopt like a sysadmin mentality around your models, right? So as the models start declining, maybe I should get alerts. Uh, so because most people, most people when they talk about models, they really stop in the model building phase. They don't really address the whole pipeline of deployment and monitoring models. But yeah, the temporal model to measure whether you've sort of you know this regression towards the norm. Um, of optimization is, I think, a really interesting angle of like there's a meta, there's a bigger loop of let's make sure that the the model itself keeps self-correcting. Uh, Roger, you uh, have always been a big proponent of data anthropology and applying the social science and design thinking to the field of big data. I mean, since you and I started talking about this stuff years ago, that's always been a bee in your bonnet. Um, how important do you think the social sciences are in the big data field right now? Well, I think if you're ignoring them, you're really going to miss out on something. We actually, we like it so much, we've actually hired an ethnographic firm to help us augment what we're doing with data. Um, and, and that's the thing. There are things that the numbers, the instrumentation are really good at doing, but we're humans. So not only are we irrational in many ways, the analysts who are looking at it are irrational in many ways. There's all sorts of cognitive biases and so forth. Without bringing in uh, interviews, without talking to people, without getting a sense of what's going on in the world, you're likely to miss uh, big changes. You're likely to miss uh, things around optimization. Uh, you're also likely to miss motivation and emotional um, engagement with things. And I really think you need to loop those things together. And so we really like, like talks that help expose that so that, you know, the kind of fundamentally, how do you get to the right questions? How do you know what you're missing? How do you understand your cognitive bias uh, when we're looking at stuff? And your institutional cognitive bias as a company. I mean, it's, I think it's great when you find out something you just you can't even process because it's so out of what the conventional wisdom is. Now you've got something to throw your data at. And it also gets back to what we were just talking about, the temporal nature of models and so forth. Without um, uh, talking to people, you don't really know where, you know, what to suspect, what's going on with how people are interacting with these uh, with these algorithms and so forth. So it doesn't mean, you, you know, neither, neither side is like by itself, but how they interact with each other. And we think for this field to keep advancing, that's going to be important because just plain numbers only optimization is only going to go so far. It's not going to come up with the next thing. Talking to people, understanding how to integrate that with data will, and so we'd like to hear how people are doing that. And I want to make a point about that. That looks a lot like design. So design and social science to us are very, um, very closely connected. And we um, you know, see design techniques as being important to around asking the right question and how to instrument and so forth. Um. One of the things that I saw recently that, that I wanted to talk to you guys about, and I haven't really, I haven't seen you in a couple of weeks, so we haven't talked about it, but uh, there was a story you probably read about a restaurant owner who his sales were down, and so he called in a restaurant consulting firm, and they did what restaurant consultants normally do, and they broke out the security footage for the restaurant. They started looking at uh, quantifying the data in that security footage, the, the metadata about the footage, which is how long do people sit and eat on average, um, what do they do, that kind of stuff. Just for giggles, they went and broke out a video footage tape they had from years ago. And the differences were pretty stark. Um, the modern diners would come in, they'd get on their phones and tweet their friends and find out where everybody was. And when everybody showed up, then they'd sit down and they'd like check out Yelp and see what people liked about the food and they'd order it. The food would come, they'd take pictures, they'd sit around griping about the meal on Yelp, you know, and they'd take like an hour and 20 minutes, I don't remember the exact numbers. In the past, people would sit down, they'd order their meal, they'd eat, they'd leave. And so the impact of uh, social interactions and sort of I haven't eaten dinner until I've shared it with all my social networks was, was actually hurting this restaurant's business. It's a fascinating story. But what I took away from it was we are moving towards good computer vision. And I know this is like a 20-year project where a computer can harvest data from video and give you interesting metadata. But once that happens, we're going to realize that every video camera that's been recording stuff since the start of television was actually a sensor and we can kind of roll back the clock. You're going to be able to point a computer at it and say, tell me about, you know, troop movements. Tell me about people who were sitting on the sidelines of political rallies. And the computer will come back and go, we found these seven people. 
and those people did not live in an era of data, but the video record that we have amassed is retroactive data. And when you can point successful, useful computer vision at that, you manufacture a tremendous amount of data, metadata. What's interesting about that, that New York Diner story is not that people were using their smartphones. It's that when a computer can do that and tell us interesting things, which admittedly is 20 years away, that's a very different shift. Like, like it's no longer am I being monitored it's, I'm always being monitored, and there's just no way around it as long as someone with the horsepower can point a computer at it and tell me, say, tell me interesting things about this video. No, I mean, I think generally, I mean, I, I'm personally interested in the usage of new data sources like this, right? So video right. Um, and uh, audio and all, all these other things, right? So, um, so, because now we're starting to see people who came out of spaceship temporal pattern recognition, apply machine learning techniques to sports analytics, right? So uh, uh, we know a company in Los Angeles called Spec Second Spectrum that uh, basically their tools work on any uh, data set that's primarily around moving dots. So right now it's sports analytics, but who knows what that would be in the future, right? So you brought up video. Uh, yeah, we'd love to. We'd love to see people give talks on what they're doing analytically to make sense of massive amounts of video. All right, we have about ten minutes left. Um, I got one question off Twitter that I thought I'd ask you guys um, from Amrita. Uh, what industries do you think are going to get destroyed by big data, and what industries do you think will will be revitalized or rise up? So go ahead and prognosticate. No one's going to hold you to court. Yeah, you know, I don't know that. <laughs> that there's going to be that many industries destroyed. I think what's going to happen is the dynamics in industries are going to change. And that people who figure out how to make data um, a good part of their decision making without over relying on it or undervaluing it are going to be the ones who often end up, un end up winning. And I think you mentioned this whole like kind of surveillance society kind of thing is that um, inevitably there's a lot of instrumentation already there for people to take, to take advantage of. So I think what you'll see is, I mean already, you brought up Uber or Lyft a few times. Um, look at what they've done to the taxi industry and how they've changed it. Now they've changed the taxi industry but they haven't like devastated people moving from place to place by private cars. Um, so I think that's a good example of what you'll see in many spaces that data will will end up being able to make a difference and be ascendant. Anyone who's read the um, story of the company that became um, oh, the big Capital One, the credit card company, it's a great case study. But they, there were two guys I think who felt there was an algorithmic way to adjust interest rates. And, um, think, and, and, and treat their customers more um, individually. And they spent a few years taking losses so they could learn. And I think companies that figure out that operating is like a big experiment that you keep running and running, that you'll, um, and that you need to, like, whenever you make a decision, you've got to figure out what you're learning or not learning by making that decision will be what changes those fields. So I, I don't mean to cop out of the answer, um, but I, I do think that the um, changes will be dynamic within industries. Uh, now having said that, I think that um, th there probably will be, you know, just the data business itself. Uh, you know, just yesterday Teradata bought uh, Big Data Analytics. Um, this is a space that you know, five years ago, everyone talked about SQL Server and Oracle, and now they're talking about a whole different, you know, a different space, a, a data analytic, data engineering space. I mean, yeah. I, think, I yeah. mean, I, uh, be more specific. I, Come on, kill somebody here. I think the probably uh, I'm fascinated about how the use of data is going to probably change how we consume some of these uh, punditry and forecasts. Right, so because a lot of people are still, frankly, in the seat of the pants uh, school of doing these things. Um, 
and and also, I mean, even even the people who we look to as being more sophisticated, doing uh, econometric analysis. I would suspect that there's going to be a lot of disruption there, because just because they're really limited to data sets that are in some way so old, right? So devised during the Great Depression and things like that. So I think that. Uh, uh, that whole punditry and forecasting business is going to be one of the uh, next industries that are going to be really affected by all of this. A justifiable casualty. I think uh, police and military and government are really interesting too. I mean, yeah. if you have a world where everything's monitored, that's minority report, right? Like people don't commit crimes because they're worried of being watched. Um, but also uh, government regulation when you, when you have sort of algorithmic regulation. There's good and bad. There's, there's going to be people gaming the algorithms there, but that, that's important. And I think, uh, you know, all sorts of things like military. If, if you have an asymmetric war, uh, something where the bad guys and the good guys have a very different amount of force, so the bad guys tend to resort to horrible acts of terror or whatever, uh, and the good guys have, um, you know, massive overwhelming force, uh, it tends to be that the only uh, solution to meet um, that force is data. So uh, software can scale, and I think the implications for uh, military, for policing, for government uh, are going to be uh, significant. I think if the founding fathers had had Facebook, they might not have wanted representative government. Um, they might have just wanted direct democracy. So I, I'm curious to see what happens with direct democracy, which has been tried in Switzerland and elsewhere, uh, and how that will change things. And I think uh, education is going to be huge because – um, turning on feedback loops. When you read a book, it reads you back, right? Um, this idea of flipping the classroom so that um, homework and, and, like, we do homework at home, which is the stuff we should be doing with the teacher, and then the lecture the teacher's doing um, should be done at home. So flipping the classroom and applying data to education, once the unions get out of the way and once uh, we clear some of these, these legacy interests, um, I suspect that education will be massively changed. Urban planning, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a few that are that are going to be in, neat, and the the question is always when I come back to these, it's the it's these forces that exist to try and keep the status quo, and uh, it's really really hard to see that stuff. You know, Uber is worth billions of dollars, but frankly, there's a lot of cab companies that didn't want to write an app or make the experience any better for consumers. If they had done, Uber wouldn't have had a, like it's it's why is it so hard to? Um, Travis had this comment. He said, it's a political fight. Our candidate's called Uber, and we're up against an asshole named Taxi. They guys sworn twice on the thing, but that's his quote. And, and, and it really does seem like, you know, there's little incentive. So I think I'm with Roger to some extent. There's little incentive to change until the pressure is overwhelming. And data, big data puts a huge amount of new pressure on industries to change or, or be rewritten. Yeah, you know, I've been bringing up an example recently why are there college lectures since you brought up education? The answer is, there used to only be one book. Right. And someone had to read it to the class. That was changed 500 years ago. We still have true. lectures. Totally true. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a depressing thought. Thanks, Roger. I needed that. Um, okay, uh, we promised that we'd spend a little bit of time on uh, uh, what sucks and what works. Um, I've spent a lot of time analyzing this stuff. I crunched a bunch of data across different conferences. Um, let me explain very briefly for the audience how we handle proposals, and then we can all talk about our pet peeves. So when we do a call for papers, we receive hundreds, almost a 1,000 sometimes, of new submissions. And those submissions are um, stored in, in detail, and there's a program committee of around 50 people who go through. And the program committee can review those submissions. Generally, each program committee member has an area of specialization, so they care about business or data science or ethics. Um, and they'll look at the, one, the, the proposals that have had the fewest reviews. And that way we ensure that each proposal gets five, six, seven sets of eyes on it uh, as the initial sort of making the short list. And each of those reviewers rates the proposal from zero to five stars and uh, can put in comments. And then we generally go through and try to make sure that one of us has seen every proposal at least um, to bubble up things that maybe got miscatalogued, for example. Um, sometimes those proposals we think, hey, that's better for another O'Reilly event like Solid or Velocity. Uh, and then we kind of make a cutoff list of probably about four, four and a half stars where we're like, things above that, they must be really good. Having crunched the data, the single biggest predictor of uh, whether or not your proposal will make the cut is whether it's a pitch. Uh, I actually did a tag cloud once that showed 
the uh, most commonly uh, cited words in the program committee review of the talks. And for those that received less than two stars, it was basically a tag cloud with the word pitch in like 80 point font and little tiny words around it. And uh, from that list, we then go through and we find uh, the talks that make sense. Uh, Roger and, and Ben and I do a lot of horse trading and we uh, try to make sure, for example, if, if one company submitted 10 great talks, we probably don't want to give them 10 slots because we want to be fair, so it's a harder decision. Uh, but we try to make sure there's, there's obviously diversity in there, uh, people of different gender and ethnic background. Uh, we try to make sure that we have um, a variety of talks that touch on some of the aspirational topics, not just where the industry is today, but where we think it's going. Uh, we have a number of invited speakers that we're chasing down because we think they, they've invented something cool or we really want them. And that's generally what leads to um, the final CFP, which, uh, sorry, the final lineup, uh, which we announce over time as we confirm people. Uh, so there's like a waiting list if people can't make it and so on. Uh, did I miss anything? Is that pretty much? I mean, I think we look for talks that have uh, uh, takeaways, right? So I think uh, sometimes it makes sense to, to do your talk. Sometimes maybe when you have to uh, uh, illustrate it using a particular product. But that doesn't mean that... Uh, uh, so we're, you know, in that case, we're not limiting ourselves to just open source necessarily. What we're looking for are, are clear takeaways, right? So we want the audience to be able to go home and have uh, things they can try, which may not require the tool that you used, right? So, right. And that's why sometimes the, if you're illustrating a meta concept, you probably have a better chance than your specific feature. So the fact that you use your feature to illustrate that meta conference, that, that, that meta um, concept is good because then someone has a takeaway. Oh, I can use machine learning to get this thing done. I can um, use this algorithm for this type of uh, situation. I can clean things up with this type of uh, workflow uh, uh, philosophy. And and that's you know that's what we think makes the conference a great conference is that you're constantly given information that, that you can use. So if you think about how to make um, um, what you're saying useful. I'll, I'll give one quick um, example that actually I heard Ben use around case studies with someone. Is if you have one case study that shows how great your tool is, that probably isn't that much of a takeaway unless you're going to buy that tool. But if you have five case studies that illustrate a bigger point, this is how an architecture that works across these case studies. This is the kind of finding they get. Well, that is going to be interesting and something that you can take away. Yeah, patterns uh, rather than just yeah, individual. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why we like those unboxing. Yeah, oh, the unboxing ones are great. And I think uh, one of the things, one of my pet peeves is we see a number of talks where we say we'd love case studies. And we get a case study submitted and the speaker is amazing. And then we notice that the email is actually a PR agency. Then we try and contact the speaker and the PR agency mails us back. And we're like, wait, did the person even know they were on there? And so there's a little bit of baiting and switching. One of my biggest pet peeves is people who are just disingenuous. I want to see a proposal submitted by a speaker who cares about being there, not a proposal from an agency. <clears throat> that that uh, that costs like that takes two stars away in my ratings right away. And in the cases where I've gone, hey, that's a great company. I'd love to go find them. Some of the time we find the person. They're delightful. They're amazing. We have a great talk. They get on stage. Uh, some of the time that person doesn't even respond to my mails. They just forward it to the third-party vendor who proposed them over and over again. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to remember that next time I see a proposal. So um, one of my pet peeves is, is people who try to dress up an, a known end user as an excuse to do a vendor pitch because that's just So let me, ask, let me ask you two because um, I have a pet peeve against panels. So what do you guys think about panels, Roger? So I'm asked to moderate panels a lot, and um, I, I think if the panel feels like it's really exploring something, and people are going to come prepared, and you got to show that, that that's okay. I think that you can get a bit of a different perspective, and maybe you can get some disagreements that illustrate something to the audience. But when a panel is just four people from leading companies who don't prepare and just show up, and it's just a random conversation, that's where the negative um, kind of feeling about panels are. So I, too, am going to be more careful about reviewing a panel. Yeah, I've got some pretty 
strong thoughts on this. Um, so I think panels, as you said, Roger, can be awful. Uh, they can also be amazing. First of all, panel cannot be in a green contest. If everyone on that stage is going to say, I agree with Bob, I agree with Mary, I don't want any of them. I may as well just listen to the first speaker because they all agree, right? So why are you wasting my time? I have seen two formats that work really well. Uh, and we've done these before. One is to make it into a formal debate. So we've done these Oxford-style debates. Technically, that's a panel, but you've naturally taken the people and polarized them. You've given them a topic. You've given them some structure. And you have this audience vote about who won the argument. And so I'd, I'd argue that's sort of a panel, but I really like those debate formats, especially if the topic is simple. We did one a while ago called Clouds Are Secure at another conference I was involved in. And that was a great polarizing topic, and people came away going, I've learned tons of arguments for and against, right? The other model that I've seen work really well, and I don't think we've done this, but I would love to try it. I've done it at uh, Startup Fest and some other conferences, is um, something called a chain reaction panel. So imagine you have four speakers. The first person interviews the second for seven minutes. Then the second interviews the third. The third interviews the fourth. The fourth interviews the first. And the moderator is generally the first person. So we did a, a discussion like this about whether entrepreneurs need to be street smart. And I started the discussion. By the time we got to the third speaker, it became about, you know, isn't it an advantage to come from a broken home because you learn to be adaptive with few resources? We had no idea the conversation was going to go there. And it was, for everybody, it was like, wow, that was an amazing discussion. So I think panels work if you are able to create a format where the audience, where the participants are forced to explore something. And I'd love to see people innovating not just in the content, but in the format they propose like that. Uh, you know, you got a 40-minute slot. Make it amazing. Make it memorable. Yeah, I want to bring up one quick thing around the submissions. I love seeing videos because we do care how you speak and we do care how you present. And I, we just have to, and I think this is pretty common amongst the people who um, uh, are in the program committee, is that when there's no video, there's something taken off because you just don't know. And it doesn't mean you have, you know, if, if English is your second language and stuff like that, that doesn't matter so much. It's more that we can determine that when you're presenting, the audience will be able to get something from it. And that's what we're looking for. Um, it doesn't have to be a TED uh, coached talk. So that's I, have a really another, good point. I have another pet peeve. Some proposals have three or four speakers, right? So to me, I think max two speakers at most. Yeah. And we've seen red flags. I've seen where people paste in the bio straight from the company's website, and, like, you know it was pasted because it mentions other people, and it's sort of out of context. So there's, there's giveaways that people phone it in. I mean, we spend a ton of time. I would say we devote hundreds of hours from, from 50 people's times to going through these things, and, and a good proposal helps a lot. Uh, if you don't have experience presenting, getting involved in like Pecha Kucha or Ignite in your community, there's, or even Toastmasters, there's great ways to do this stuff. But these days, it is so easy to record video that, that I would say you're right. It's like an omission, like what are you hiding almost because so many people have done it. Um, and the other question, we have one question from the guys at Splice Engine. Uh, do we care about architectures that power real-time big data versus the AI machine learning data science? Uh, I think the reality is we do. We care about them in an architectural standpoint. But a company like Splice Engine is focused on what I think is an increasingly important space, which is how traditional enterprise IT can make the jump to big data. In their case, you know, I'm used to RDBMS. I can still use RDBMS, but it's Hadoop under the covers. So as we start to see more enterprise adoption, I think uh, we're going to ask, we're going to want to see a lot of stories about, like, how did companies actually make that leap from traditional, uh, you know, transactional databases to analytics and things like that. Uh, how did they reinvent their business, um, you know, changing the engine while the car's driving down the road? Uh, so I think enterprise IT stories like that will be good. Uh, the challenge always is there is that an enterprise IT company tends to have an enterprise IT vendor that's, that's infiltrated the company, and so uh, it tends to wind up looking like a single industry solution. Not that that's a bad thing. You know, people are doing great things with SAP or Microsoft or whatever that are sort of infused, and, but, but if you're already that company, is there a reason why you continued to use them? Uh, what did they bring that was new to the table so you didn't have to rip out your existing IT infrastructure? Those are good questions. And I think we're seeing, especially in the East Coast, an increased number of people uh, in enterprise trying to figure out how to implement this stuff. Yeah, we love, we love enterprise stuff. You know, I think there's a tendency to think about Strata as um, startup-oriented and so forth. But 
we that is a tip of a spear, and we'd love to highlight that stuff. But to make that stuff effective is how does it get in to other organizations, and and how do big organizations who have enormous um, not so much roadblocks but things to consider around risk and uh, existing architecture and capability resources and so forth that make making a big change uh, difficult. So addressing those issues, I think, is great. Because, so we know that there's a lot going on. How to adapt, adjust, and engage with those new things is a great enterprise topic. All right. That's, um, I think we covered a lot of stuff. I want to be respectful of people's time. Um, some big things to take note of coming up. Uh, the call for papers is still open for another week, uh, so we want to see lots of things. This is, again, for the Strata San Jose event coming up uh, after the holidays. Uh, Strata New York is uh, soon to be upon us, Strata Plus Hadoop World. And as part of that, there is the Startup Showcase, since you mentioned startups, uh, the short Startup Showcase call for proposals, which is still open. Um, and we have uh, dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of submissions there each year. Um, and the people who are finalists for that get to come and pitch their stuff to judges on site. Uh, it's always a great experience, and I know some of those companies have gotten uh, funding and huge partnerships just out of, as a result of that attendance. Uh, so, yeah, it's going to be a busy fall. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, Roger, Ben, any closing thoughts? And don't forget about Strata Barcelona. That's right. That's right. I'm looking forward to traveling to so Europe. For people of you who can't make it across the pond, so to speak, we are going to be in Europe. That's right. Great. Feeling very cosmopolitan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and a great show we think for Barcelona too. So definitely. All right, great. Thanks so much, gentlemen. We've run out of time. Uh, thank you again, Ben, Roger, and Alistair for taking the time to answer our questions on behalf of Strata Conference. And also a huge thank you to our community for watching and submitting their thoughtful questions. Uh, if you'd like to continue the conversation and be informed of more events like these, be sure to follow us on Twitter uh, at the handle at Stratacomp, uh, or join us on the O'Reilly Media Facebook and Google Plus page. We hope you found this event enlightening and educational. And on behalf of Strata Conference and O'Reilly Media, thank you again for watching. We wish you the best success in submitting your proposal and all of your 2015 data endeavors.